Amen. So here we are in our Baptist Basics series. We're going to talk um, this evening about our Bible. So um, this series is about, you know, the fundamentals of our faith. Why, why we believe certain things, just talking about the fundamental doctrines. You know, we've talked about baptism. We've talked about all the different fundamental um, doctrines of um, being a Baptist and what that means. But basically what it means is that we just hold to the doctrines of the Bible. And the Bible that we use is the King James Bible, the King James Version of the Bible. So this evening, I want to talk to you about why we are and will always be King James only. Okay? So first of all, you know, you don't have to keep your place in uh, Psalm chapter 12, but the Bible talks a lot about heresy. Okay? The Bible talks a lot about heresy. The Bible warns about heresy. Heresy. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's look at um, you know, what the Bible says about heresies, when they'll come in, um, what to look for. Um, the Bible warns us about this in um, several different places. So let's look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, first of all. So there's a lot to the King James Version. Um, this evening I want to focus uh, largely on the New Testament, why um, the New Testament that we have um, is the correct one, and just some, some methodologies and some things that happened. And, you know, it's nothing new, these things that have happened. It's nothing new. The Bible tells us that these things are going to happen. And uh, it's just another way I want to also show you, you know, how we can know that the King James Bible is God's pure words. Okay? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 17. First of all, the Bible itself warns us that people will try to um, twist or pervert the words of God. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt, we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God speak we in Christ. He says, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Look, first of all, this whole idea, you're going you're gonna to get people that are scholars and PhDs and all this kind of stuff that really try to pull you in the weeds on how, you know, the Bible, well, they found all these different manuscripts that are from the first century. I mean, that, the first thing I want to get across to you is that means nothing. That means absolutely nothing because the Bible was being corrupted in the first century. I mean, we just studied the book of Galatians and, I mean, that's exactly what was happening. People were corrupting the Word of God. For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. It was already happening here. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, just a couple uh, chapters over. Look at verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. Look, Paul's writing all these letters that later became, you know, our New Testament combined together. People were already corrupting his words. They were already handling the Word of God. They were already handling his letters deceitfully. It tells you right here. This, I mean, that's the point of, of Paul, you know, he, why he was writing so many letters in many cases, to just try to fix people that were changing the doctrines of the Bible. As it was being, as it was being written, it was being corrupted. Do you follow what I'm saying? So this idea, oh, we found one that's older. First of all, you know, did you or didn't you? Who really knows? But, I mean, even if you did, that, what does that even mean? It was being corrupted as it was being written. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'll explain to you also how we can know. You say, okay, well, it's being corrupted while it's being written. Well, how do you know what the right one is? I'll explain that to you as well. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In verse number 1. Look what the Bible says. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye be soon that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by a letter as letter from us as the day of Christ is at hand. So look, turn to Galatians chapter 1. We just went through this. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Look at verse number 6. Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 6. The Bible says, I marvel, marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 
As we have said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you other than you have, ye have received, ye, by the way, you know, ye have received, let him be a curse. I'm going to explain that to you too, what ye means. Then you'll know. So you won't be confused by the King James Bible. Okay? But look, he's saying here, I marvel that you are so soon removed. Meaning, he was just there. And somebody's already corrupting the gospel. I mean, it was shocking to him. So when somebody says, oh, we found an early manuscript, I mean, pff, what does that mean? You know what I want to know? I don't want to know when it was found. I want to know what it says. That's what I want to know. Because that will tell us if, it is, if the Spirit is of God, what it says. So look, the Bible also says this. You say, oh man, you say, how does the Bible even have a chance? I mean, that's depressing, right? Isn't that depressing? Think about it. Think about you're living in the first century. Just bring yourself back in time. We're all living in the first century. Jesus has come. Jesus has died on the cross. All these things from the Old Testament have been fulfilled. I mean, the Messiah has come. Here it is. We're out preaching the gospel. We go to Galatia. We're given the gospel. We got a good group there. We planted a, a church in Galatia. We leave, and like a week later, two weeks later, we hear that somebody has come in and perverted our words and perverted the words of the Lord. I mean, imagine, that's depressing. That's depressing. You're like, oh, how in the world is this Christianity, is this gospel going to survive? Turn to Matthew chapter 5. I'm glad you asked. How in the world would such a message, if it's being corrupted by so many people, I mean, are, are most people saved? Nope. Oh, look, we're the minority here. So we're the minority telling the truth. The majority of people out there are spreading lies, are spreading false gospels. Look at how many false religions are out there today. I mean, how does the gospel even have a chance? Well, guess what? God's involved. And he's made some promises here. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 18. Look, we would have no chance at the gospel surviving, at the word of God surviving, if God didn't step in. There would be no chance. Matthew 5, 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Turn to Mark 13. Turn to Mark 13. I mean, this is a really simple one in Mark 13. Look at verse number 31 of Mark chapter 13. The Bible says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Look, that's a, that's a promise. That's a promise. Heaven and earth, all this will go away. My words will always be here, is what God says. And it's repeated in Luke 21, 33. Turn to Isaiah 40. Turn to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, look at verse uh, number 8. Isaiah 40 and verse number 8. The Bible says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Look, that doesn't say the word of God will last for a while or for a couple of hundred years. It says forever. As long as man is on the earth, until God ends this thing, according to this plan, God's word will be avail it will be somewhere preserved, Amen. is what the Bible says. Look at Psalm 12, look at the front of your bulletin, Psalm 12, 6 through 7. The words of the Lord are pure words. Look, that means, look, so God says that my words will never pass away. They will be, they will be here forever. So you will pass away, everything will pass away, the grass will die, the flowers will die, everything will go away. My words will not pass away, and they're also pure, the Bible says. The, the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Thou, meaning he's talking to God directly in a singular form, is what that means, thou. He's saying, thou will keep them. Look, God will keep his words. Amen. And God has kept his words. He's kept them here. And we have them here. So here, enter the King James translation. 
Here's what you had by King James I in England. I'm not going to get too detailed into the history of it, but King James I out of England in the early, you know, the late 1400s to the early 1500s, there was 54 men handpicked by the king. These were the world's leading experts on biblical scholarship and languages of the Bible. Of the, let me just read a quote for you. Of the 54 translators, Four were college presidents, six were bishops, five were deans, 30 held PhDs, 39 held master's degrees, there were 41 university professors, 13 were masters of the Hebrew language, and 10 had mastered Greek, the New Testament and Old Testament, as that's referencing. Every man involved, now this is important, every man involved in the King James Bible translation believed in the verbal inspiration of the scriptures and believed in the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the final analysis, the translators of the King James Bible believed that what they had spent nearly seven years of their lives producing was an exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Okay? That's important. That's important who they were, what they believed, what they used, what they used for their translation. So we're talking about you know, using the Hebrew Masoretic text for the Old Testament and for the New Testament, they relied heavily on the Textus Receptus, as it's known, or the received text in Greek. This is what these men used. Now, the Textus Receptus is what I want to focus on this evening. This was the work of Desiderius Erasmus, and it was published in 1516. So much, it was already there, it was already published by this man, Erasmus. It was the Greek New Testament at that time. Now, Erasmus, he was affiliated, he was a Catholic priest, people will cut him up for that. But look, it is documented, it is documented that as he studied the Bible, he became closer and closer to the Anabaptist theology uh, of the time. It is documented that he was actually warned on occasions that he was moving dangerously close to the Anabaptists. You know that, you remember the Anabaptists? The Anabaptists? You know who that is? It's these guys who the Catholic Church was hunting down and killing because of largely their, their refusal to move away from salvation by grace through faith. And they would not add baptism to salvation. They would not add works to salvation. So they were killed for it. Perhaps more than anything else, let me read you a quote. Erasmus began to advocate baptism by immersion after conversion. Some Catholic. Though this was well called an Anabaptist heresy by the Catholics and the Protestants, don't forget, it was simply Bible teaching. The third edition of his Greek New Testament of 1522, different from the second only in its introductory notes, there Erasmus advocated that Christian youth be taught biblical instruction first before they were baptized. He even advocated rebaptism for those already sprinkled as infants. Amen. Look, this man, not only did he move towards the Anabaptist or the Baptist theology or just what the Bible actually said, he was considered and still is considered by most to be the leading Bible scholar of that time. I mean, the man was incredibly smart. So we have this Textus Receptus that he produced, that he published in 1516 that was used by the King James translators. Okay, that's really what I'm not trying to get into the weeds. That's what was used for the New Testament. It was the Textus Receptus. Thousands of transcripts exist and 99% match the Textus Receptus. Even of, even of transcripts to date. Just think of the King James Bible in general, folks. You have thousands of transcripts that exist that match this New Testament. You have a document written over 1,500 years by 40 different human authors that did not, that ranged from kings to fishermen, to all sorts of other types of laymen, and there's no contradictions. So, why change it, is the question. Why change it? The title of the sermon this evening, if I had a title, is Motives and Crimes. Like, before, before there's a crime, there has to be a motive, right? 
I mean, before somebody commits a premeditated crime, they have a motive, right? I mean, if I go out and I rob a bank, I go out and I, I stick up a bank and I, and I risk going to prison for my whole life, I, I mean, I must have had a motive that was pretty strong, right? I didn't just go do that like, oh, I'm bored. Let's go rob a bank today. No, I had a motive. I was in debt. Something was going on where I needed money so badly that I just, I was going to, it was worth risking prison for 10 years to go rob this bank. I mean, every premeditated murder has a motive. Every single premeditated crime has a motive. But you know why they'll say they changed it? You know why they'll say, you know, to get rid of the archaic language. That you'll hear, that's what you'll hear today. That's what you'll hear from people that are publishing modern Bible version after modern Bible version. You know, we're getting rid of the archaic language is what we're doing. We're getting rid of the these and the thous because that's so hard to understand. Let me just explain the these and the thous to you in about 10 seconds. Okay? The these, thou and thee, I mean basically thou and thee and ye are replaced in modern Bible versions by one word, which is you. But, I could be saying, look, you need to get your act together. I could be talking to everybody. Or I could be saying, you need to get your act together. I almost fell off the, the stage. <laughs> right? But look, I mean, you can obviously, if I say you need to get your act together, you all know that I'm talking to you. If I go up to Brother Matt and I say you need to get your act together, you know I'm talking to him because I'm here. You can see my body language. You can see who I'm pointing at. But what if I just wrote that down? Could you really tell who I was talking to? No, you couldn't. So the thous and the these, those are singular. That's somebody talking to a single person. Ye is talking, or you is talking to a group of people. Okay? So by replacing, I mean, was that hard? Okay, maybe that was 27 seconds or whatever. But basically, it's plural and singular. By using you, you dumb it down. You know, you take away some meaning there. Now look, there's, there's many specific offenses that are way worse than this, but this is just an interesting point here, is that you've introduced some rounding errors. That's what we would call as engineers. Who knows what pi is? What's pi? What's the number of pi? Does anybody know? 3.14159. Wrong. It's 3.14 is what most people think. But you know if you actually do a lot of math with 3.14 and you don't go to 3.14159, you'll end up with a building or a bridge that's several feet short. Because once you do all the math and plug it into all the formulas, you need those extra three digits out to, those, out to, to that accuracy in order to make sure that things work right. Look, you've just introduced, you've dumbed down the Bible and you've introduced some serious errors. I mean, that's just one small thing. So I'm just trying to point out that the whole we're trying to get rid of the archaic language is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. You actually make the text dumber by doing that. You take away detail from the Bible. Okay, so now, enter, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Enter the mid to late 1800s. So the King James Bible in its first edition was published in 1611. Now there were several other editions, punctuation, spelling changes, things like that. We're not going to get into that. It says the same thing though. Okay, it says the same thing. The 1611 King James Bible lasted up until 1850s and here come these two guys and they say, you know what? We have a new methodology to interpret the Greek New Testament and interpret the manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. So first of all, and I, I think most of you that go to this church probably know this, but whenever somebody comes to you regarding the Bible, they're like, brother, I found something new. Brother, I was reading the Bible last night and I found something that nobody else has found. Just red flag, folks, red flag. This is what happened in the 1800s. Okay, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 1.9, the thing that hath been and the thing that shall be and that, that which is done is that which shall be done and there is no new thing under the sun. You know that every single heresy that you can come up with for the New Testament, whether it's Gnosticism or all these different versions of, you know, Arminianism and our, you know, all these Calvinistic things, this all came from like right away. I mean, this stuff popped up right away. There's no new thing under the sun. 
So here come these guys. We've got a new methodology. We have a new critical text methodology way to come up with a new Greek New Testament. But first of all, you know what the best selling book in the history of the world is? The Bible. Okay, so you know, you know how you could probably make some money by printing a new Bible. You know, it sells. That's another reason right there. But look, Westcott and Hort, Brooke Westcott and John, he's got a couple names, but just Westcott and Hort, you can look them up. They came up with a new methodology to come up with a new Greek New Testament. And they actually called it the New Testament in the original Greek, and it was published in 1881. This New Testament is the basis for all these new Bible versions. And it dethroned, look, it dethroned the Textus Receptus. And to many academics today, it has still dethroned the Textus Receptus that was used to produce the King James Bible. They used the Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus, you know, to you know, heavily use those two things, those two, um, those two transcripts, to make their Greek New Testament. And these were, these were thoroughly and quickly rejected by Erasmus. You say, you say, why? Many people will say, well, Erasmus, he, he didn't have, you know, thousands and thousands of, of uh, transcripts that he carried around with him everywhere. But you know what he had? He had a lifetime of studying the Bible. And he quickly saw, you know what you can quickly see when you look at, so if, you are, if you are studied in the Bible, and you look at the Bible, and, and you look at a new transcript of the Bible that someone says is the New Testament, and it's just missing all these things that have, like, key doctrine, like, I don't know, like the deity of Christ missing from them, you're just like, oh, yeah, this is garbage. That's what he did. It wasn't how many copies were available. It wasn't when it was written. It wasn't, oh, this is from the first century. Uh, it was what it said. And that's why he rejected it. These guys used it. Okay? It was rejected by him. They're, they're called the fathers of the New Age Bibles. Westcott and Hort. So who were they? Let's look at it. Let's look at who they were. They, I mean, they founded this new way. This new way. I mean, I mean the, the King James Bible. The King James Bible. The Textus Receptus in Greek. The foundation of the King James Bible in in English was, you know, it was pretty much um, the only show in town. It was the only show in town for like 300 years. So I guess God didn't preserve his word for 300 years. And then these guys came along and they fixed that problem for God. Let's look at who they were. Let's look at who they were. Because I think, look, I think their motives and their beliefs are important if we're going to study this. The first thing is this. They were both they were both heavily involved in the occult. It makes perfect sense to me. Once I get through all this, it's going to make perfect sense to you who these guys are. It's going to make perfect sense. They're heavily involved in the, in the occult. Westcott and Hort, and Hort founded several occult societies, two of which were the Hermes Club and the Ghostly Guild. Hort writes in a letter to his wife in 1864 about a party that they went to and they tried to do a seance and bring, um, bring spirits from the dead. These are the guys that produced the, the, the New Testament in Greek that dethroned the Textus Receptive, Receptus. Are you kidding me? He speaks, Hort speaks, as late as 1880 about the, fe quote, fellowship with the spiritual world and the dominion which the dead have over us in his own words. Here's Westcott quoting on the infallibility. In a, these are all letters that these guys wrote. These are all written, penned, you know, words from these men. Westcott on the infallibility of Scripture. I reject the word infallibility of Holy Scripture overwhelming. Of course I feel difficulties which at present I cannot solve and which I never hope to solve. Look, this, we believe that this book is infallible, that it's pure, that it's perfect, that it contains no errors. And here's the thing, and I've said this many times, I'll say it again. If there's one error here, can I trust any of it? If I find an error in this book, how do I know that there's not another one? 
If there's a, if there's a, when I say an error, if there's part of this book that says something that contradicts another part of this book, I, I've got a problem. So these guys, it's ironic. They didn't believe in the infallibility of Scripture as they corrupted Scripture. I mean, define irony. What doctrines do they attack? The deity of Christ. I mean, it's almost like, first of all, I mean, we ran into some of this cult stuff today. I mean, it's almost like, <sighs> I mean, what do they go after first every single time? The deity of Christ. The deity of Christ. The deity of Christ. The Mormons. The Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, are you kidding me? It's always the deity of Christ. I mean, talk about nothing new under the sun. They were attacking the deity of Christ before Christ was even crucified. I mean, are we surprised? Should we be surprised? Here's, here's, a, here's Westcott on the deity of Christ. He never speaks of himself directly as God. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this from stupid people that have never read the Bible before. But the aim of his revelation was to lead men to see God in him. Man, this guy needs a hoodie and a, and a bar stool is what this guy needs. This is Liberal Church USA right here. John... No, this is him again. John, meaning the, the gospel of John. I mean, if you're going to prove the deity of Christ to somebody, where are you going to go? The, uh, John uh, 1? 1? Like the first verse in John. John does not expressly affirm the identification of the word with Jesus Christ. <laughs> just like, just forget it, man. You know, I mean, uh, what in the world? Turn to John 1.1. 1, 1. How about John 10.30? I and my Father are one. I mean, is that hard to understand? I mean, people freaked out when Jesus said that. You know why? Because you know what Jesus was saying? I am God. Isaiah 9, 6. The mighty God. I mean, what in the world? I mean, these guys don't even know what the Bible says or they reject what the Bible says. I think it's that one. And they're, and they're translating. They're giving us a New Testament. Oh, I can't wait. John 1.1. 1, 1. John, John does not expressly affirm the identification of the Word with Jesus Christ. Okay, let's study this one out. Put your thinking hats on. So he's saying that John does not connect. Follow me here, okay? The Word, Jesus. Okay? He's saying John does not connect these two together. All right? Look at your King James Bible. John 1 1. Let me turn there. Hang on. John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word. There's the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so we know that the Word is God. Right? The Word, the word equals God. Now go to John 1.14. John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There it is. Jesus equals the Word equals God. It's all right there. But John does not expressly affirm the identification. I mean, what? You know, this is on purpose. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. These are not stupid men. Okay, this is on purpose. It gets better. I mean, you think, just wait. There's more. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. Turn to Revelation chapter 3. From Hort, quote, Revelation 3.15 might no doubt bear the Arian meaning, the first thing created. What he's saying there is the Arian meaning, meaning Jesus, he's denying the deity of Christ. He's saying that Jesus Christ was created, that Jesus Christ was a created being. This, this, this was first, this was before Jesus was even crucified. This is not original. Turn to Revelation 3.15. In your King James Bible. Revelation 3, let's start in verse 14. Revelation 3, 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thee work cold or hot. He says the beginning of the creation of God. He's translating that to mean that Jesus Christ was the first thing created. I mean, he's missing a fundamental doctrine of the faith here. And that is, Jesus wasn't the first thing created. Jesus was the creator. 
It was by Jesus. By Look, and you need John for this. So the fact that he missed John completely is just this heresy taken even further because the word was created, or the world, the earth, everything was created by the word. Amen. Jesus is the literal creation. Turn back to John 1. Turn back to John 1. You say, what do you mean? Jesus created the world. That's what I mean. You say, but God spoke it into existence. Exactly. The Word became flesh. Jesus is the Word. He became flesh. Jesus created the world. John 1, 3. Look down at your Bible. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus made everything. Jesus made everything. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse number 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 16. The Bible says this. It says, For by him all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. Turn to Psalm 90. Look, it's the Jehovah's Witnesses that teach that Jesus, you know, was created and he was Michael the Archangel and all this stuff. It's the Mormons that believe that Jesus had a beginning. The Muslims teach that Jesus was a human prophet. Look, these are the cults and, I mean, the satanic religions that teach that Jesus was created. And that's what these guys thought. That are giving us a Bible. Look at Psalm 90. Look at Psalm 90. Psalm 90, look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or thou, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world. Formed, meaning created, made. If you form like something out of clay, that's you actually making that. You formed it. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Jesus is from everlasting to everlasting. And he's the creator of the world. He was not created. But here's Psalm 90 in the NIV. You say, what does it matter? Here's Psalm 90 in the NIV. Now look at, how, look at how subtle this is. Look at how subtle this is. Psalm 90 in the NIV says this. It says, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So instead of, you know, has formed the earth and the world, it's just, oh, you brought forth the world. They just dumb it down. They just, I mean, it's subtle. But they dumb it down and they turn this into, oh, you, it could just be God, not the Creator, Jesus Christ. You see? It's amazing how you can look at their beliefs. You can look at their beliefs, or more accurately, their unbelief, and you can see how they change the Bible. There's the motive. There's the motive. And we see the crime. We see the crime today with all these, these Bible verses. Now turn to John chapter 10. What do they believe about salvation? What do they believe about salvation, eternal security? Look at John chapter 10 and look down at verse number 29. And this one's so, I mean, it's so misunderstood. I mean, the thought, quote, this is from Westcott, the thought of John 10, 29 is here traced back to its most absolute form as resting on the essential power of God in his relation of universal fatherhood. Now here's a footnote. Here's, here's what you say. I don't even know what that means. Here's what it leads to. Here's a footnote in the NIV. Okay, are you looking down at John 10, 29, where your King James Bible says this? My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. A footnote in the NIV says this. What my Father has given me is greater than all. What in the world? Like, like, who was given something in, that, in this case was Jesus was given something. No, no, no. We were given Jesus. We were given Jesus. And Jesus wasn't, my Father has given me. What my Father has given me is greater than all. That doesn't even make any sense. Given Jesus, he was, Jesus was given something. Who was given something? We were given something. John 10, 28 through John 10, 30 is talking about our eternal security. How nothing can make us unsaved. How we are kept, our salvation is kept by God and not us. 
And they, I mean, it's talking about keeping you eternally, not about giving Jesus something. Look, Jesus didn't come here to be given anything. Jesus came here to do the giving. Here's, a, here's another good one. This is from Hort. From Hort. I confess, I have no repugnance to the primitive doctrine of a ransom paid to Satan. Turn to Matthew 20, 28. I can see no other possible form in which the doctrine of a ransom is at all tenable. Anything is better than the doctrine of a ransom to the Father. What in the world? He's talking about the ransom that Jesus paid was paid to Satan. That's what he just said. Look, these guys are Satanists. These guys are literal devil worshipers. Is it fitting together for you? They're working directly for him. Look at Matthew 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man, Jesus, came not to be ministered unto. He didn't come to be given anything. He came, he, he didn't come to be given anything. But to minister, he came to do the giving, what I just said. And to give his life a ransom for many. Look, he paid the debt you owe to God, not Satan. You owe, a, you owe a debt. I mean, I know we don't have to go through this. Go to John 3. This is one of my favorite, favorite verses. Go to John chapter 3. Go to, I mean, look, if you don't get this about the Christian faith, on, who, on what you are being saved from, this is why we go through these verses. John chapter 3, look at verse 36. This is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible right here. Because it is so clear of a picture to show people uh, of what salvation is and what you must do, what you must believe to be saved. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of Satan abideth on him. No, the ransom is not paid to Satan. The wrath of God abideth on him. Before you're saved, look, if you're not saved, the wrath of God is on you. The wrath of God is on you. Brother Ryan told somebody this in a very nice, loving way today. And look, sometimes you may have to tell people this in the nicest possible way as you're pleading for their souls. Because look, these people that we're out there and we're talking to, the wrath of God is on them. And the ransom was, it was paid to God, my friends. I mean, the, the ransom paid to Satan, this is what these guys believed. How about hell? You think they believed in hell? <laughs> I mean, do I even have to keep going at this point? Hell, here's Westcott. Hell is not the place of punishment of the guilty. It is the common abode of departed spirits. Now, this right here, there's a lot of, there's a lot of Bibles out there, new Bibles. Shocking. There's a lot of new Bibles out there that have this weird doctrine of hell. That everybody goes to hell. And there's Hades, and there's paradise. We all go to hell, okay? But hell has like, it's like a hotel, right? Hell's a hotel. And there's like a, a part of hell that's not, just, just stay with me, okay? There's a good part of the hotel that's not as bad as the bad part of the hotel. One's called Hades, and you know, this is what Luke 16 teaches, right? And they'll say that the King James Bible has that wrong, because it says the rich man, you know, he went to hell. And immediately he opened his eyes and he was in hell. And, you know, but Lazarus was in the good part of the hotel, and then, you know, the rich man was in the bad part of the hotel. But we all go to hell. I mean, look, there's a lot of stupid doctrine, and like a lot of crazy doctrine that a lot of dispensationalists especially believe as far as this goes. Okay, so it's not just something to be like, huh, how could he believe that? Look, the King James Bible teaches hell. And hell is a place of eternal torment. And if the wrath of God is, ab is abiding on you, and you die, you're going there, and you're never getting out. That's what the, it's not confusing. It's terrible, but it's not confusing. Here's another one from Hort. We have no, we have no sure knowledge of future punishment. <laughs> I mean, and the word eternal has a far, far okay, let me, we have no sure knowledge of future punishment, and the word eternal has a far higher meaning. Okay, when people start doing this to you, by the way, when people who are really smart start doing this stuff to you, like they take normal, simple words like eternal, how many times have you been out soul winning? First of all, do we talk to really smart people out soul winning? 
Sure, we do, right? Do we talk to some simpler people that aren't very smart out soul winning? Sure, we talk to the whole range of people out there. How many people have you ever met out there that don't understand the word eternal? Like nobody. How about everlasting? How about everlasting? I mean, these are complicated words, right? How long is eternal? Um, that is a higher meaning. I have never heard that. I've never heard that. I've given the gospel to, I don't know, I, I don't even, I'm not even going to say a number, so I don't you know, try to like out-spiritualize everybody. Okay? But here's the thing. I've never heard anyone say they don't understand these words. But no, 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 no. No, it has a, no, you see, you don't understand. It has a far higher meaning. You just gotta, you gotta, you gotta recognize people like, like you know, I, I've, I've worked with a lot of people like this. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't build a lawnmower. They couldn't build a Lego stack that's like over 12 inches tall. But they're really smart and they're just like, oh, well the thing, uh, the BTUs of the thermodynamics of the, the Q factor of this, they, they don't even know what they're talking about. Okay, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a methodology of trickery. Okay, on creation. Here's Westcott. Have you read Darwin? This is his words. Have you read Darwin? Who was just right around this time, by the way. How should I, how should I like to talk with you about it? In spite of difficult, difficulties, I'm inclined to think it is unanswerable. In any case, it is a treat to read such a book. <laughs> he writes again, but the book which is the most engaged me is Darwin. Whatever may be thought of it, it is a book that one is proud to be a contemporary with. My feeling is so strong that the theory is unanswerable. The theory of evolution. If so, it opens up a new period. <laughs> Could you please write me a Bible? Please? You know, can someone hire these two guys to write us a Bible? Here's Westcott. No one, this is a good one. It's long, but it's worth it. So just stick with me here, okay? Westcott states, no one now, I suppose... This is the late 1800s, okay? This isn't like 1992, all right? Think about this. Think about the, the corruption that's going on here. No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I don't know. I do. I don't know. I, I, I'm just, you know, I'm pretty educated, and I hold that the first three chapters of Genesis are a literal history of the world. I reject the fact that this world is billions of years old. I reject it. Amen. I've looked into all of it. All the dating, all this stuff. It's all flawed. And the Bible has never been shown to be untrue. As a matter of fact, every single thing that they find and every single thing that they will find will just prove the Bible again and again and again. Amen. This world is a little bit over 6,000 years old. Amen. And that's the truth of it. Now, no one, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. Yet they disclose to us a gospel. So it is probably elsewhere. Are we not going through a trial in regard to the use of popular language on literary subjects, like that through which we want, not without sad losses in regard to the use of popular language on physical subjects? You see what these guys are doing? They're using the language that they're using to make this New Testament to, to feed their philosophies, is what they're doing. He's, he's, he's admitting it here. He's admitting it here. If you feel now that it was to speak humanly necessary that the Lord should speak of the sun rising, it was no less necessary that he would use the names of Moses and David as his contemporaries used them. You see what he's saying now? Now he takes it beyond the first three chapters of Genesis and says, he's like, there was no critical question at issue. Poetry is, I think, a thousand times more true than history. He's saying even the stories of Moses and David are just simple poetry. And as a matter of fact, he also said David is not a chronological but a spiritual person. But these guys were heretics that were experts in Greek is what was going on here. And these men are the source of these modern English translations and this, and this critical text methodology that has given us all these Bible versions that we have today. Look, the motive is clear, and we can clearly see the crimes in all these Bible versions. So, to wrap things up, I'm going on too long here, but did God preserve his word? Did God preserve his word? To be King James only, you do not have to be a Bible or language scholar. 
Okay, you don't have to go out and learn Greek. You don't have to go out and study all these things. You just have to believe that God can preserve His Word. I'm going to explain it to you. To believe the modern versions, you have to believe this, that God did not preserve His Word for 300 years. And that the King James, you know, because the King James Bible was the only book in town. You have to believe that God just let His Word just be... And then He miraculously started preserving it again when Westcott and Hort came along. Using, and, he, and He did it using a couple of Satan worshipers. This is what you have to believe. To not be King James only. You can clearly see the agenda on these men's beliefs. And you can see the agenda in their translations. I just showed you just the tip of the iceberg. Look, Westcott and Hort, you've all seen it. You know that the new Bible versions, what do they attack? What do they attack? They, they attack salvation by grace through faith. What do they attack? They attack the deity of Christ. What do they attack? They attack these major tenets of the faith. Westcott and Hort changed the Bible. They omitted dozens and dozens of partial verses and dozens of complete verses and over a dozen complete verses. Look, turn to Revelation chapter 22. Just the fact that they did this, just, we read this to somebody today, too. We read this to somebody today, too. We read this to somebody to show them that the Jehovah's Witnesses, when they're using their version of the Bible, where they have just com completely perverted the gospel, Jesus, everything. We use this verse. Look, all I have to do with Westcott and Hort is this. Turn to Revelation 22 and look at verse number 18. The Bible says, For I testify... This is the, these are the last verses in the Bible. This is the last thing that God had to say. Like, God has wrapped up the entire Bible. Like, His complete word to us that is eternal, from eternity to eternity, in both directions, this is the last thing that He has to say to us. Right here. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Interesting that he just, you know, throws in that grace thing right at the end, too. If any man takes away any... Look, these guys are burning in hell. Because they change God's word. Just for that thing alone. So let me just give you two parting thoughts here. We see the motive and the crime. We see their beliefs and we see what they did. You know, look, I mean, we see that Westcott and Hort, they denied the fundamentals of our faith. They denied it. There's their motive. And we can put the King James version of the Bible next to their translations and you can clear... Look, there's some, there's some uh, people that have already done this. They put King James version verses right next to modern Bible version verses and you can see the clear attacks on the doctrines. You can see the omissions, the changes, and those omissions and changes, they match their doctrines of unbelief. I mean, it's a, it's a cool thing to see. You can just see the motive and the crime right there. And that's, I mean, that's the purpose of this, the sermon this evening. On the other hand, the King James Bible. You say, oh, people say, oh, King James, he was a wicked king. God used wicked kings all the time. I mean, God used wicked kings to accomplish his tasks all the time. And look, Erasmus, you know, people, oh, he was a Catholic. And look, but from the things I've read, he began to match pretty close to Anabaptist or the Baptist theology as he read the Bible. You know what that, you know what that shows me? You know what that shows me about this man? Aside from all his, his scholarly reputation and how smart he was and how well he knew the language, but his willingness in his own words to change his beliefs as he studied the Bible, shows me where his heart was. You'll see the same thing from Christians. You'll see the same thing from Christians. Christians that are willing to just change. Well, cause just because just you get saved, does that mean you know everything in here? Like, bam, you're saved. That was simple. Do you know everything in the Bible? No, but as you learn the Bible, as you're willing to change your life, you know what that shows? Your brothers and sisters? It shows that your heart is right. And Erasmus, his heart was right. He was willing to change as he studied the Word of God. So look, here's, here's the last thing I want to tell you. The King James Version versus the modern versions. If it wasn't God-inspired, if it wasn't God-inspired, where are the errors? Where are the errors? Like I said, 
40 different authors over 1,500 years, no contradictions. You know, there is, there's more of the transcripts that have ever been found, they match closer to the Textus Receptus than any other version of the Greek. To the tune of 99%. Look, maybe these guys were geniuses. These guys that, maybe these 40 different guys were geniuses. You know what, there's a, God, there's a reason God used fishermen. You know that? God used fishermen for the same reason that he only gave Gideon 300 men. You follow what I'm saying? He only gave Gideon 300 men because he said, no, 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 you're going to win this battle and you're going to know that I did it. That's why you're not getting 10,000 men. You're getting 300. God used fishermen. God used laymen. God used sinners. Because he wanted us to know that it was him speaking and that it's him preserving it. And he wanted to know that it was his words, not their words. And that's why it all matches over a thousand years or more. It's him doing the preserving. The new versions, I mean, there's contradictions everywhere. I mean, it's crazy. It's why, it's why Erasmus rejected the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus almost immediately. He's just like, oh yeah, this is garbage. <laughs> because he knew the Bible. Because he knew the Bible. It wasn't, it wasn't when they were written. That doesn't matter when they were written or how many copies existed. It's what they say. It's what they omitted. It's that they changed the word of God and he recognized that. It was the doctrine. That's why he rejected it. That's what matters, the doctrine. He had been studying the Bible his whole life and he recognized the errors. As a matter of fact, most, cli I mean, these new versions, most cliche contradictions that people will bring up, like atheists and people that don't believe the Bible, most contradictions, people, did you know? I mean, people that, will, that have never read the Bible, that will talk like they're Bible experts and will come up to you and they will just like, they would just like throw out like what are some of these things like the Bible like the Bible condones slavery. Did you know the Bible condones slavery? Arr! You know they're reading some stupid modern version that does condone slavery. I mean I preached a whole sermon on on the difference between biblical servitude and you know Western world slavery. Men stealers in the King James Bible executed. The, do you know? Did you know? that the Bible condones rape? Well, the NIV does. No, I'm serious, it does. It says that if a man rape a woman, then he has to marry her. What in the world? In the King James, I mean, what in the world? Who would ever want to be a Christian? You believe the Bible? That condones rape. The NIV does. It literally says that. You have to pay your father and, and, and marry her. Well, that, that's good. The King James says, uh, what happens to the guy? Oh yeah, he gets executed. You, you rape a woman, you get executed. I mean, that's pretty close though, right? I mean, turn to 1 Samuel 13. Look, these are where the next sermons on the King James stuff will come. I'll just throw some of these things up there and we'll just go through it and we'll have a good laugh. But look, people use these new versions to actually attack the Word of God. It's like, don't, I mean, most... Most Bible contradiction, you know, conversations, I would say like probably 80%, maybe 90% of them, you can just say, oh, you have the wrong Bible. Conversation over. Look, I've looked into all these contradictions. I, okay, I don't want to say all of them because there might be some that I haven't heard of, but the vast majority of Bible contradictions are either people are using the wrong Bible or people don't understand the depth of the Bible. Those are the two things right there. Look at... Um, Look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, a very controversial verse in the English Standard Version. I'm going to read it for you. I mean, there, this is very controversial. People use this to disprove the stupidity or to, to prove the stupidity of the Bible. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. In the ESV, you don't have one in front of you. I'll read it for you. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And he had reigned for two years over Israel. Saul, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. Saul was one year old baby when he became king. Can you believe that? <laughs> Saul was a baby when he became king. Wah! Give me an army. Wah! Where's my passy? 
He can't even, he probably can't even talk. When do kids start talking? I haven't had little kids for a while. Maybe he was really smart. Where's my passy? Give me an army. <laughs> King James Bible. You have the wrong Bible. That's your problem. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel. Oh. Oh. Man, I thought he was a baby. It's crazy. Here's the thing. Here's the thing what I'm trying to get at. Satan didn't do a perfect job of translating the Bible. God preserved his words. Okay? God's words are pure. That garbage is not. And it's easy to see because, you know, most of the Old Testament stuff, look, the New Testament stuff's pretty heavy doctrine twisting. And, I mean, there's some of that in the Old Testament too, but there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament of the New Versions that's just dumb. It's just a clear mistake. Like, it's just clearly they just didn't know what they were talking about or didn't know what they were doing or whatever, or they were just lazy. I mean, Saul lived for one year and then became king. Okay. But look, Satan didn't do a perfect job of translating the Bible. That's God's job to preserve his word. And Satan didn't do a good job, but he made mistakes doing so. And look, this isn't anything new either. This isn't anything new. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Go to Genesis chapter 3. This isn't anything new either. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. With these, this Westcott and Hort, it's just, it's almost like, you know, just it's tiring. It's tiring. It's the same thing again and again. You know who did it first? Satan himself. Verse 24, no, I'm sorry, verse uh, number 1 of, of Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent of it was more subtle. That means he was sneaky. That means he didn't just come out and say stuff. He didn't just say, hey, God said this, but do this. I want you to do this so I can get you in trouble. No, here's what he said. He said, he was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not any, eat any tree of the garden? Yeah, that's what God said, first of all. But he's trying to cast doubt on the word of God right here. He's trying to cast doubt on God's word. You know what he's trying to do? He's trying to cast doubt on Jesus. You know what he's trying to do with these modern versions of the Bible? He's trying to cast doubt on Jesus Christ. That's what he's trying to do. That's, I mean, there's nothing new. The King James Bible is proof of the King James Bible. I'll, I'll tell you the analogy again. If I find, you say, how is that? That's circular logic. But here's the thing. If I find a machine, if I find a machine in the woods, and the machine can, can produce energy like nothing I've ever seen before, and I, and I go and I take the machine to engineers and scientists, and they look at the machine, and they say, this machine is defying the laws of physics. This machine is a miracle. Why? Because it works. We know it's working because it's working. We can measure it, we can test it, we can look at it, we can try it. We can try the words of this book. We can read them with the Holy Spirit within us. We can try it, we can look for, con we, there is none. Amen. There is none. And you look at the machine, and then we look at the back of the machine, and it says, invented by, you know, Bob Jones in 1892. You know, we're probably gonna believe that because of the fact that the machine itself works. The machine is proof of the inventor is what I'm getting at. The King James Bible and the miracle that it is is proof that God preserved it. Does that make sense? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.